when you sit, you notice that every moment is different, every moment is new. You don't hold on to the last moment. And when you do, you suffer, and you can feel it. You can feel it in your sitting. There's only the truth that's so now. With practice... As a teacher, interfaith leader, and poet, Norman Fisher is known for his intellectual power and relevance. Because as long as we're alive... He is the founder and spiritual director of the Everyday Zen Foundation, dedicated to expressing Zen Buddhist teachings in contemporary form. For five years, Norman was co-abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center, holding the seat established by the great Suzuki Roshi, one of the first Zen masters to teach in the West. Zen is the school of Buddhism that really focuses all of its attention on meditation practice, but with a very special twist. And that special twist is that Zen understands meditation as not being merely a technique of calming and focusing the mind, but it understands meditation as being itself. Life itself is meditation. Life itself is awakening. And the effort to really understand that and live it is the goal and the process of Zen practice. What attracts me about Zen practice is there is a sort of intelligence to it. It's an understanding of what living is. It is a study of living and the byproducts may be being a good person, but it's a byproduct and it's not the practice. When I was young, I wanted to get into the biggest, best thing ever. I wanted to get into the movies. So I headed off to LA when I got out of high school, slowly got into the movies, and it's not quite like that. In Hollywood during the 1980s, Michelle Mayrink met with exceptional success on films like Real Genius, Valley Girl, and Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsiders, starring with hot young actors like Matt Dillon and Diane Lane. It's like there's a little carrot being dangled out there, and if you could get that carrot, it would be the ultimate satisfaction. But you never got the carrot, and I wanted something more that I could give myself completely to. I was looking for a deeper sense of reality. When I left LA, it was a big decision. I got into Zen practice as an outcome of looking for something more satisfying than what I was getting out of my life. The central practice of Zen Buddhism is called Zazen. Za means to sit. Zen means meditation. Meditation which is described as one-pointed concentration or absorption. An experience of union with the world just as it is. Among practitioners, Zazen is affectionately called just sitting. With Zazen we're just sitting with the feeling of being alive. Feeling the feeling of being alive. And to help us stay focused with that, we pay attention to our posture and our breathing. So we rotate our pelvis forward a little bit, arch the lower back, lift up the chest, the back part of the head pressed up toward the ceiling and the chin tucked in so the whole body feels uh, stretched and opened. And then we feel our breathing in our belly. Breathing in, breathing out, the belly rises and falls. Breathing in, knowing that we're breathing in and breathing out, knowing that we're breathing out. After a moment we come back to the feeling of the posture and the feeling of the breathing 
to keep us anchored and present right where we are, uh, being alive, the feeling of being. And the mind wanders, and very gently we bring it back. In the morning, John and I get up, we put on our robes, I'll make a pot of tea, John heads out to the zendo, turns on the heater in the winter, lights the candles, starts sitting. Once the tea's ready, I go out, bring the tea. Sometimes we reverse this, but usually I bring the tea. We have a ritual that we follow, which is I do the clappers, he sounds the bell, we bow, I serve tea. After we've done this tea routine, we sit. He starts off the sits with a series of bows. And then we chant for 20 minutes, and then we'll meditate. This ritual is probably the best thing for our marriage because we probably wouldn't have a marriage without it. I don't think that's a real common bond for us. You know, it's my life first, it's John's life first, and we're married and we practice husband and wife. But this little ritual, all of a sudden you're independent now. When we head out to the Zendo here in the morning, we've developed that to help us also pull us out of this mundane life and suddenly go, this is what you're doing, guys. It's a practice of living. So we wear robes, which looks weird, and I've thought about that. Some people might look at that, what's she trying to prove? But it's only for me to help me get out of the morning house go, give me a cup of coffee. Oh, the kids are driving me nuts, too. Good morning to the world, and I'm alive again. The point of ritual and formal practice in Zen is, uh, first of all, it creates a very strong atmosphere in the meditation hall. The practice of bowing is a kind of a practice of softening yourself to really accept your real nature as a human being, the nature of being an awakened, wise person that you are, but you don't know it yet. <laughs> You're struggling to, to get to know that. You know, our lives are very surface-oriented, and in many ways, what concerns us is kind of trivial. And so we need some help, you know, getting to that which is inside us that is deeper, calmer, and wider than that. Often, we can't find that stuff on our own, but with the help of these ritual containers, we get to that. And then we make a practice of this question. I think a lot of Western people are allergic to religion and allergic to religious forms. It somehow reminds them of something in their youth that they didn't like. So people don't like discipline and regimentation. The meditation hall in Zen is very strong, very quiet, very focused, very concentrated. And also, little by little, it dawns on you, very beautiful. The rituals themselves are quite transformative. Uh, you know, somehow they really touch you deeply.
Samu comes from two words in Japanese, sa for work, and mu meaning to devote one's attention to something. In traditional Zen monasteries, Samu is work that encourages mindfulness. Typical Zen work is that kind of work, and it's really good because you focus your mind. It's simple, repetitive work, and you just stay with what you're doing. And it's a kind of a way of meditating in motion. When you chop wood, you just chop wood. You give yourself completely to chopping wood. When you carry water, you give yourself completely to carrying water. And there's a kind of a beautiful appreciation and clarity and gratitude that comes out of whatever it is that you're doing. That's the point. Whatever it is that you're doing. If you really can be faithful to every moment of your experience, this is meditation. Zen practice, if you're going to do Soto or you're going to do Rinzai, if you find an excellent Rinzai teacher or if you find an excellent Soto teacher, you're not going to be doing anything differently. Yeah, I'm setting this weekend retreat up with Norman Fisher. Our, uh, Michelle's neighbor, Jeannie Robinson, studies with Norman Fisher in the Soto tradition of Zen, while Michelle herself practices Rinzai. But they've worked out a friendly way of sitting together. The teacher that I went to was a Rinzai, and I didn't know the differences so clearly, but Jeannie, who I met up with and started sitting with, is Soto. We think about, well, probably about a year and a half we've been sitting together, I'd say. And then the, the first big problem was that you faced the wall, and we didn't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a pretty dramatic difference, so, but, uh, but ultimately they're just we forms. <laughs> They're just forms. How we worked it out was uh, I showed her our forms in the Soto Zen practice. She showed me, she and John both, their forms. And uh, it wasn't a problem. The space spoke to us. <laughs> Rinzai Zen has much less ritual than Soto. And the students sit facing each other in the meditation hall. In Soto Zen, there is more uh, ritual, uh, chanting, and so forth. Although still, sitting is the main thing. It's hard to, in the abstract, think about which school of Zen is best for me or which kind of practice is best for me. I think that go and see and trust your gut. Trust what feels right. Well, of course, being a Soto Zen priest myself, I say Soto Zen is much better. <laughs> Don't you think that we should all feel that what we're doing is the best? You realize that what you're doing is the best, and also each person, what they're doing is the best. You see, I mean, I don't have to compare. In order for me to be committed to my life, I don't have to make my life better than yours. In fact, it's quite the opposite. If I need to compare my life to yours and make sure that mine is better than yours, then I'm not really committed to my life. I'm committed to some sort of a shaky notion of my life. Once a week, usually on a Saturday, we head out to doors and we start our work day usually as a group and 
everyone has their individual jobs that they do. We carry on for as long as the kids are willing, and as they tired out, they head it on inside, and John and I carry on the work. And it's something that we've done probably for the past six years. And they've grown up with it. The benefit that I see with them is they actually start liking work. It's not a bad thing anymore. It, it's an enjoyable part of our life. As much as we're able to, we try to take out the need to get the job done to the practice of doing it. And the kids love that. The kids love to do things with their parents very naturally. But it's not fun to do it with the parents when the parents are going, let's just get it done, kids, you know. Work practice then becomes the idea of taking on work as part of your practice with an attitude of giving and serving and with as much focus and friendliness and love and compassion as you can possibly bring to bear in your work. That's what work practice is. Why is this day different from yesterday? And why am I I and not you or her or it? Why does the pond ripple with the wind and why does the dog bark at nearly everything and why is that annoying to me? I write poetry because I can't help it. I've been doing it ever since I was a child. So it seems to be just part of my function of living is to write poetry. So I do it. I surrender to my nature. When I write poetry, I'm really more in communion with reality, with what's on the other side of the poem. So I don't sit down to write a poem about something I know or about something I've experienced. I sit down to write a poem because I don't know. The poetry is the deepest expression of my practice. Why is it music moves me and why do I nearly cry when someone's selfless for a moment, even in a movie? Why was I born? Why do I live another day? Where did I come from and where am I going? Why do flies appear suddenly from nowhere and what do flies think about or grasshoppers or fish? suffering, the obvious suffering, you know, not getting what you want, the suffering of getting what you don't want and not being able to get rid of it, <laughs> things like that are the obvious kinds of suffering. But uh, really the root of suffering is off-balance, impermanence. I thought when I was little that people naturally wanted to die at a certain age. It just evolved like a flower and then you die and it was acceptable. And I heard someone talking about someone that was older and they were dying and they were fighting it. And that terrified me. I was pretty young when I heard that story and that came back to me then and I just knew I don't want to be terrified at that moment. But it's going to take some work to get there. Religious practice helps us to incorporate death as part of our lives, to understand it in whatever human way we can understand it, and to be able to release ourselves to it when the time comes. So it's a very important part of practice. But there is no such thing as death. There's only breathing in once and then breathing out and not breathing in anymore. There's only time, you know. Death is happening every moment, right? Every moment we die to the past moment. It's over, it's gone. 
as time is passing. That's what time is, right? Time is the dialectic between living and dying. So that means that uh, death is something that uh, liberates our lives and awakens our lives. Because how can we be fresh now if we don't let go of this last moment? Die to this last moment, receive this new moment. Fresh for this new moment because let go of the last one. So our practice is about that. And then when the last moment comes, we're completely alive in that moment. We give up that moment. And the only thing, another one doesn't come. Only human beings can question their being, can question what being is, what it means to be alive. Religious practice is a device, all religious practice, not just Zen, is a device for opening up that question. Zen, for me personally, gives me a reason to live, and that's pretty important. I think enlightenment is releasing ourselves to our lives and finally saying to ourselves, yes, I guess this is my life. I guess this really is my life and what a miracle it is. What a problem, what a perplexity, what a miracle. commit yourself to for five years Norman was co-abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center holding the seat established by the great Suzuki Roshi one of the first Zen masters to teach in the West Zen is the school of Buddhism that really focuses all of its attention on meditation practice but with a very special twist and that special twist is that Zen understands meditation as not being merely a technique of calming and focusing the mind, but it understands meditation as a being itself. You notice that every moment is different. Every moment is new. You don't hold on to the last moment. And when you do, you suffer. And you can feel it. You can feel it in your sitting. There's only the truth that's so now. With practice... As a teacher, interfaith leader, and poet, Norman Fisher is known for his intellectual power and relevance. Because as long as we're alive... He is the founder and spiritual director of the Everyday Zen Foundation, dedicated to expressing Zen Buddhist teachings in contemporary form. Life itself is meditation. Life itself is awakening and the effort to really understand that and live it is the goal and the process of Zen practice. What attracts me about Zen practice is there is a sort of intelligence to it. It's an understanding of what living is. It is a study of living and the byproducts may be being a good person, but it's a byproduct and it's not the practice.
when you're six. When I was young, I wanted to get into the biggest, best thing ever. I wanted to get into the movies. So I headed off to L.A. when I got out of high school, slowly got into the movies, and it's not quite like that. In Hollywood during the 1980s, Michelle Mayrink met with exceptional success on films like Real Genius, Valley Girl, and Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsiders, starring with hot young actors like Matt Dillon and Diane Lane. It's like there's a little carrot being dangled out there. 